The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the twelfth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, your Christ. Grace to you, mercy and peace to you from God, our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 31. The hour has come, Jesus tells the people. Oh, Lewis, come in. I'm glad you found it. Somebody make sure Lewis has a, a service booklet, please. The days are coming, says the Lord. The hour has come, Jesus answered them. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. Jesus tells his disciples. There is a sense of urgency in this reading from the Gospel of John. This Sunday, the liturgy, the lessons prepare us for Holy Week, setting the stage for the story surrounding Jesus' last days that we celebrate at this high point of the church year, getting ready for Easter. The spiritual themes are set. They force the questions of faith. They call us to pay attention to the times Jesus' times, our times, times, all times in which the voice of God, the word of God, the presence of God rumbles in the background like thunder in the image of that reading today. Do you get the sense of urgency? That's the first question. And now, this sense of contradiction, of conflict. Listen to all the opposites, all the kind of oppositions and tensions that are given voice in the readings tonight. Binding and losing one's life. Obeying and failing. Hoping and doubting. Love and hate. Belief and despair. Life and death. The Word of God generates this sense of conflict, these tensions, these contradictions. It's one thing to hear about them and read the urgency and the conflict and the Bible story, but it's not something that translates so easily into our lives as God's people, especially in our institutional body, the church. Most of us don't enjoy conflict. Most of us are conflict-averse. Even though we may have habits or behaviors that, that draw us into conflict or begin conflict, most of us would say, I don't enjoy conflict. I don't want to create conflict. It's easy enough to be drawn into, but in my experience, it is hard for us to use conflict constructively. That's what's hard. We devote our resources to dealing with it as quickly as we can, either fleeing away from it or urgently or trying to win it as quickly as possible. But how will this work with Jesus? With you and me and Jesus. 
When we sense the urgency and conflict in his message to us, in his word to us, in his presence near us, what will we do? What do we fear the most? Are we afraid to commit ourselves? Or are we afraid not to? Do we trust what we know? Do we trust what we believe? The verses leading up to our reading from the Gospel of John for this fifth Sunday in Lent tell the unique story of Jesus and his friend Lazarus. The whole chapter 11 in John's Gospel is devoted to this story. Lazarus became ill. He died. He has been buried. Jesus comes and prays to his father, and then he calls Lazarus out of his tomb. This event has made Jesus quite a celebrity. He's become famous. The chief priests even consider whether they should put Lazarus to death. Again. (laughs) Why? John tells us since it was on account of Lazarus that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. As John describes Jesus entering Jerusalem triumphantly riding the young donkey with people waving palm branches and shouting, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He reminds us, the readers, why the people behaved in this way. It was because they had heard that he had performed this sign, raising Lazarus, that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees are exasperated. The leaders of the Jews are attempting to control the events as they are unfolding. They yell at each other in frustration. You see, we can do nothing. Look, The whole world has gone after him. Just after that verse begins the gospel for today. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. The world. The Greeks are, the Greek-speaking peoples are those who are not Jewish. They are the Gentiles, the non-Jewish peoples of Jesus' time, some of whom we know had become honorary Jews, God-fearers, believers in the one God of Israel and had even adopted some Jewish customs and came to celebrate at the festivals and so on. Some of these Greeks, these Gentiles, say to Philip, Jesus' disciple, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. What does Philip do? Does he take them to Jesus? No. He goes to his fellow disciple, Andrew, for some reason. Does Andrew take the Greeks to Jesus? No again. They go together to Jesus and tell him about it. We may find ourselves taking this approach. What I mean is there are some people in our lives, people that we know. Something happens to them, a crisis, an experience in their life that makes their lives urgent, that brings them into conflict. Urgency and conflict in life. They are desperate for God. They have a question They are experiencing an internal tension. They experience their lives as a life before God. And so maybe they come to us as Christians. Not putting things in that way exactly in all those um, specific terms, but you can sense it. You know it. They come to us assuming perhaps that we are members of the church and therefore have some experience of God. They want to have it too. And they want us to, to help them. They want to be led, guided, understood, welcomed. What do we tell them? What can we tell them after all? Perhaps the best we can do is take it to the Lord in prayer. Nothing wrong with that. Like the disciples will tell Jesus, Dear Lord, these people want to see you. But we don't know what to do. (laughs) How much better their lives might be if they knew you. Perhaps that's what we like to think. So we pray, please, Lord, reveal yourself to them. Show them who you are. I've done my part. I've said my prayers. I've checked in. It is up to you to draw your people to yourself. For so Jesus himself said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. But what sort of answer might Jesus give to our question? What should we do? We can only guess at that. It doesn't say exactly It's not a manual uh, for our every question that we might have as faithful believers. We have to think, we have to pray, we have to read and listen to God's word. John tells us what Jesus said to Peter and Andrew. 
The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now that's not a very practical answer to our question about evangelism or about how to, to talk to one another about Jesus. At least not at first. It's time, Jesus seems to be saying, for this fascination with my celebrity to come to an end. This is the context. He is he's being hunted down. He is being objected to by the Pharisees. He is being... Um, He's attracting everyone to himself by this celebrity, by his power as a wonder worker. He's called Lazarus from the tomb. It's time for this to end, Jesus says, this pattern, this way of doing things. It is time for you to give up your trust in what you think you know about me now. Are you coming to me because you think I can save your life, make it better? Let me tell you about my glory. Let me tell you what this means. Here is very truly what I tell you, says Jesus. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He says this, those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And then again, he says very quickly, whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. lest we think this is going to be some picnic. What does Jesus go on to say? Now my soul is troubled, he goes on to say. If Jesus is troubled, we should probably be suspicious of our instinct to avoid trouble and conflict at all costs. Shouldn't we at least wonder what he means by this? At least ponder what makes our lives, perhaps in some way, worth hating. We have to be careful with that word. It's a very powerful word. It's a high-voltage word. But should we not at least allow ourselves this moment of honesty, asking ourselves how much time we spend preserving ourselves and saying to ourselves, hey, I can't give it away now. I won't have enough to give later, or something like that. Can we find enough courage in ourselves to look for even one thing in ourselves to hate? To hate with God's perfect righteous hatred is such a difficult word to say, to hear. So powerful, it is so destructive. Doesn't Jesus know about self-esteem? We are easily reacting. Doesn't he know we have to be healthy and love ourselves before we can love others? How can we integrate this word hate into our spiritual vocabulary? I can only suggest that in the world of the Bible, the world of knowing ourselves as loved by God, with a love beyond measure, as knowing ourselves forgiven and released by God from any bondage, perhaps there is a way in which we can think of hate properly as the consequence of love. For as we know ourselves more and more as one who is loved by Christ, loved by God, blessed by God with so many gifts of the Spirit, with this relationship with God, which cannot be troubled or broken even by death, it becomes possible to hate that part of us that is still afraid and that walks away from that gift. Still reluctant to be used by God, to be changed by God, it becomes possible to hate the fact that we have wasted a chance to give God glory, wasted some or maybe a very large part of our life failing to pursue some injustice until it was healed, or refused to lift up someone who was bowed down, or been afraid to offer up some sacrifice of ourselves for some greater good. Have we all known this conflict, the pain it can cause? The pain that comes with knowing the overflowing and splendid love and goodness with which God has made each person that comes from knowing how achingly beautiful the world is, or can be, and yet knowing at the same time our own smallness, our own meanness, knowing that whatever form that ancient human rebellion takes in us, that rebellion against goodness and peace that is in each of us, we would probably be mean again yesterday if we had the chance, and we will be mean tomorrow when that chance comes again. So what can we say now? When somebody asks us to show them Jesus, What do they have in mind? 
What will we show them now? In the midst of all this conflict, in the midst of all this tension, Jesus asked the question for us, after all. What should I say? Save me from this? Save me from this hour? That would be nice. Isn't that what we all want to? To have the conflicts go away, to have the tension released. That's what at least part of Jesus wanted to pray. If we trust the scripture, if we trust this story, at least part of him wanted to pray that. He knew enough to bring it to speech. What should I say? Save me from this hour? His life was, his life of prayer was large enough for his soul to be troubled. His life of prayer and deep communion with God the Father helps him at least to understand this terrible question that faces each of us who want to follow him. What should we say? What should we say in the hour when it becomes clear to us that the glory of God will only be known in death and resurrection and can only be experienced as our own death and resurrection? What can we say to those who want to see Jesus? Can we say this? The kingdom is coming, but it means the end of life as you know it. Can we say, Jesus loves you so much he wants you to die with him because it seems like that's the only way you're going to give up sinning? (laughs) Can we say there's no way to know in advance what Jesus is going to tell the Holy Spirit to do with you? And our answer as much as Jesus' answer to that question, what do I say, what do I do? The hour comes. Comes to us. The judgment of the whole world occurs bit at a time, as each of us faces that question. And the fear of death comes upon us, or it doesn't. The ruler of this world is driven out, or we allow him to live another day. We trust the promise of Jesus, or we doubt it. But either way, God's word brings us this urgency, this inner conflict. Just now as we hear it, as we know ourselves to be one with him, as he is lifted up, or as we cringe and rebel against the truth of that possibility, to be one with the crucified Lord. Now, now is the time for all this, not some other time, but now as we walk with him and follow him through these days of his passion so that where he is, we may be also. Or as we allow ourselves Easter after Easter without Good Friday, without Monday Thursday, stripping of the altar, without the quiet of Saturday and the darkness of the vigil and the prayers and the waiting. Right now, so that we too may ask God to glorify himself with our lives instead of saving them only for ourselves. Right now, that our prayers may not come easily, but trouble our souls like the fear of thunder. I've glorified my name, and I will glorify it again, God says to Jesus. That is the thunder in the distance. That's the promise of the cross and resurrection, the promise of the seed in the ground bearing fruit promise of your life and mine, right now. Amen.